All right, well, thanks, everybody. I see a lot of coffee, so hopefully we're all recovering from the sponsor parties effectively last night. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start telling you a little bit uh, more about my background and why this is a topic that uh, I became really interested in uh, when I joined GoDaddy. So I joined about two years ago uh, as part of the Skyverge acquisition, and we had worked primarily with WooCommerce, but a number of online e-commerce platforms like Shopify and others. And I do still work on Skyverge and, and WooCommerce extensions really heavily. I also spend a lot of time working on our commerce platform and the online stores we host that are powered by WooCommerce. But as part of joining this much bigger team, I also got involved with a lot of different kinds of selling that I hadn't really been exposed to. And so for many of us who come from the WordPress world, we're probably familiar with online stores. Uh, but I've learned a lot about in-person retail, uh, as well as multi-channel selling as a result of the work I'm doing. And I found a lot of really fascinating things that I think um, helped me learn a lot coming from that online first perspective uh, that I think would be really cool to uh, walk through and share today. So we'll take a look at what single and multi and omni-channel actually means. Um, how do you identify the right channels to sell in for either you or if you're working with merchants as, as your clients or partners? and uh, what criteria you should be paying attention to and how you get set up and get started. So I was a former high school teacher. I like to start with definitions to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so when we talk about single and multi and omni-channel, what does that actually mean? A lot of the time we hear these in a marketing context. Right? We talk about omni-channel marketing in terms of having a marketing strategy that covers multiple different channels. And that is not how I'm referring to them here. We're talking about retail and sales strategy through different channels. So single channel commerce is probably what a lot of us think about when we think about getting up and running and selling you know, in a single place like an online store or a brick and mortar shop. Multi-channel selling is often um, conflated or interchangeable with omni-channel selling. They're slightly different. Multi-channel means I'm selling in multiple platforms but I might not have them connected or all synced together. Whereas omni-channel selling is a situation in which you sell in multiple surfaces, but all of those channels are interconnected together, sharing data, and making sure that your customer experience is unified. So we'll talk about both multi-channel and omni-channel selling in this conversation. Um, your capability to do both really depends on the tooling that you're using and the channels that you want to use to sell to your customers. So with single-channel retail, this is where I started, and probably where many of us started, right? especially if we're coming from a WordPress background, you think about selling via an online store, so a single place where you reach all customers. And as a retailer, this is really simple, and that's a huge benefit. All of your sales are in one place. All the data is stored in one place. And if you're using WooCommerce, for example, you even own that data. It's accessible to you and, and you only. It also gives you a single conversion funnel to track and to optimize. So I know when I get new customers where they're landing, what their path or journey looks like with my brand, and how they're purchasing from me. So it's a lot simpler to streamline and optimize your marketing efforts. You can even use this as like a sales tactic to create um, you know, exclusivity or, or scarcity, like you can't buy this on Amazon or Target, it's only sold here. So single channel retail, even though we're gonna focus a lot on multi-channel here, is not a bad thing. And depending on where you are or your clients are in their journey, the simplicity can be very attractive. But there are trade-offs you are definitely missing sales and customer acquisition opportunities if you're only selling in a single channel. And you're not optimizing for the way your customers expect to uh, discover your content and, and um, how they discover your brand. So in a multi-channel scenario, we sell not in one channel, but in a bunch of channels. So that might mean that you add like social selling or marketplace selling into your tool belt. This almost always increases revenue for the business who does this and it increases discoverability in different channels. It tends to increase your conversion rates as well because you're supporting customer choice. And we have some uh, really cool data that kind of illustrates that pretty well that we'll take a look at shortly. And buyers tend to trust you a lot more. So for example, you know, we're all, most of us in a new city, let's say looking for a restaurant to find, right? If I search for a restaurant, they don't have a listing on Google, they don't have an owned listing on Yelp, I am definitely not eating there. Right? Your presence where your customers expect you to be matters a lot in terms of their willingness to buy from you. 
But there are trade-offs, obviously, right? I can be more discoverable, but I've got to find and nurture the right channels and right relationships with customers. That takes time. If I just syndicate out my business to like 10 different channels with no other effort, I'm not going to have great results. Maintaining your data in these multiple locations, like having Amazon inventory and online store inventory, it can also be challenging. And you're sharing data with potential competitors who could create a private label, for example. Now, Amazon in particular takes a lot of flack for this with Amazon Basics, but this is a practice that's as old as time, right? That's what grocery store generics are. You sell a product and, and they come up with their own version of the product. So you are trading off some of your data and some of the information about customer purchasing by moving to multi-channel. It also means that you might have channel-specific workflows on how I get packages to my customers. But I do think the trade-off is totally worth it. So if we look at data from 2020, multi-channel sellers grew a lot faster than their online-only counterparts. 53% year-over-year compared to 10% year-over-year. So there are trade-offs, but if you are at a stage where you're like, hey, you know, I want to go from side hustle to a bigger business, or I want to start to scale my business, this is a really important strategy that you should be evaluating. And then how's that compared to omnichannel? Well, we have a lot of the same benefits, right? Increased revenue, discoverability, buyer trust, conversion rates. Um, but we mitigate one of those big downsides, that fragmentation of your business data. Omnichannel selling helps you to centralize that in a single place and start to unify the customer experience. But we do also still have some of the trade-offs. So we have the same effort to find and nurture the right channels and the risks of, of private label competition once you start sharing your purchase data with other channels. Word of caution is that this also makes your sales attribution and marketing ROI a lot harder to track. So when someone sees you uh, on a Facebook shop and then we retarget them with Google Ads and then they come to your website and then they go purchase from you in person, how do you attribute that sale? How do you know that your marketing is working or which campaigns to you know, pour gasoline and more dollars on? So there are trade-offs to each of these to be aware of, but again, I think it's really compelling. The data shows that those trade-offs are probably worth it if growth is your main goal. 73% of shoppers use multiple channels. And this is actually um, HBR data from 2017. So this has shifted even more towards omni-channel over time. They expect to shop in multiple channels and they spend more money when they do both in-store and online. It's what consumers expect from brands, and usually it benefits you with greater revenue, greater conversions. So it's pretty important as a business, if you're saying, look, I want to grow, what's the best way to do that? But how do you know which channels are going to be impactful for you or for your business? There are several out there, some of which we probably know, some of which if you don't work with a lot of merchants, you may not be aware of. We're all probably aware of online store as a channel, right? We work with WordPress. Uh, we probably think of WooCommerce for this, right? With over 3 million WooCommerce websites out there, obviously it's one of the most popular ways to do this. And it even has 26% share of the top 1 million e-commerce sites. So there are a lot of very serious sellers using WooCommerce to grow and scale their business. It's also great for almost any industry, right? It's not just people who ship things to customers, but people who sell digital goods or memberships, right? An online store is universally a great channel for most brands. Coming from online world, we may not always think of in-person as a channel, but retail and, and brick and mortar uh, is something I would not discard out of hand, and we'll take a look at some data why. But selling directly to consumers in person, you know, using a, an in-person point of sale, is still the most popular way to do business. Um, especially in the United States. But of course, it depends on what kind of things you're selling. Right? Obviously, I'm not going to open up a retail storefront for digital goods, for example. And when we think of channels, a lot of us probably think of social channels. Right? Okay, well, I want to go multi-channel. I'm going to go list things on Facebook or on Instagram. Right? So we think of uh, and Google as well. The nice thing about social is we can use it both for discovery, so often just like product listings, as well as in context purchasing, actually purchasing through like uh, Facebook checkout or Instagram checkout, for example. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about social and why it can be a good place to start for most brands, but why I think you should pay attention um, to your performance in those channels to make sure it's actually right for you, and also be mindful of what kind of product you're selling. So for example, digital good sellers or subscription sellers can't often use Facebook shops, it's against their terms. 
So even if you think it might be the right channel for you or you have an audience there, you should be mindful of it's actually the right place for you to build a retail strategy. And then we all probably think of online marketplaces as well, right? Okay, multi-channel means I'm gonna go sell on Amazon or I'm gonna go sell on Etsy, Walmart, eBay, et cetera, right? Um, these are great because it's a captive audience. It's where your customers already expect to shop. Um, so it gives, it gives you eyeballs, right? But it depends on what you sell and who you sell it to as to which marketplace is going to be right for you. So we'll show you a little bit of industry data that might support your decision making, but ultimately it depends on what your product is and who your target customer is. Now we'll focus a lot more on all of those channels when we take a look at some data behind this, but I do wanna call out a couple other things that are maybe not as obvious for a multi-channel selling strategy. So one would be distributor relationships. And this is actually probably a much older multi-channel strategy. One of the first brands that I worked with in WooCommerce uh, did about a million dollars a year direct to consumer through their WooCommerce store. But their uh, supplier contract with Target was worth multiple millions of dollars in comparison. So distributor relationships can be a huge lift if you get a supplier contract with you know, um, a local grocery store, right, like um, Publix or something, or like a big box seller like Target. Typically then you're selling like wholesale at cost plus pricing to them. The reason this can be interesting for a lot of merchants is because even though you do still have private label competition risk, um, if you can produce inventory at scale and leverage operational efficiency for the business, this can be a simple way to drastically expand. So if, if I'm gonna make a lot more money if I can like 10X my inventory production, this is something that you should be considering or thinking about with your clients. Say, hey, maybe instead of trying to do more direct to consumer channels, we think about a wholesale channel. Uh, it does often mean that you might have to change some things about your business. Like I know Costco, for example, always requires you to, to create things in like weird sizes. So it's, you know, like the mega size, whatever the biggest you can possibly get is. So uh, that's something to, to be mindful of when you think about optimization, but it, it's a really great strategy and tried and true for obviously, you know, decades. And mobile apps are also another great way to um, use channels in kind of like non-obvious way. So a lot of folks will create their own mobile app for a shopping experience like the Amazon, you know, iOS or Android app, um, or use the mobile app to embed purchasing. So maybe you have like a learning game that has like digital goods products in it. I'm not gonna focus too much on this one because I don't think it's great for like newer brands, um, more focused on brands that are actively growing. Um, but there is a great tool for that called App Presser and they can create a mobile version of your website for you using WordPress pretty easily. So these are a couple of other channels. There are plenty of other ways to do multi-channel selling. We're gonna focus primarily on in-person online marketplaces um, as the ones that tend to be best for multiple different kinds of businesses across multiple parts of, of your journey, whether you're newer or growing and established. So of all of these channels, how do I decide, like, should I do this in the first place? And which one is right for me and my brand? The obvious thing is that marketplaces drive eyeballs, right? There's a captive audience here. People who want to buy something come here to buy it. And if you look at these numbers, it's actually pretty crazy just how many people want to buy something through these channels. So Amazon, eBay, and Walmart together, the top three over here, I know it's probably a little harder to see, um, drive about four billion visits every month. It's like half the world visits three, these three channels every single month. It's an insane amount of volume. So if you're like, hey, where should I sell? Oh, Amazon is the top one, I'm gonna go sell there. That's certainly one way to think about this strategy, but I would also pay attention to seller density. So Walmart, for example, has more strict guidelines. You can't just go sell on Walmart if you're brand new. You have to have some track record of an online store or marketplace selling. Walmart is third in terms of traffic, and it looks a lot less. But because it's so much smaller of a seller density, every Walmart retailer actually gets 13 times the monthly views than an Amazon seller does. So sheer volume is a, certainly a decent way to look at this problem but also think about like seller density and how many people are selling something similar to you to understand if you can actually leverage that volume for the business or not. So what about if we talk about this in terms of sheer dollars? We have really good data on US retail from the Census Department. And so if we look at US retail alone, 
It's expected to exceed $7 trillion this year, with e-commerce finally in 2020 projected to top $1 trillion of online website sales. But if we take a look at this middle area, right? So the top is in-person retail, the blue is e-commerce, and these middle sections in black and teal are marketplace and social selling. So even though the whole pie keeps growing year after year, marketplace and social selling are starting to expand how big of a share they take. So we can see that the trend is very clearly that retail is diversifying into multiple different channels. And if you're a brand trying to succeed and grow, you should be trying to ride that wave. So if we take a little bit more of a granular look at that data in that chart, we're like right here in 2021. And I know that marketplace and social selling still looks like it's a small part of that chart, but I want to show you the actual numbers for comparison. In 2019, e-commerce sales, which remember will be a trillion dollars this year, were about 10% of total retail. In 2014, that was 6%. So there's been astronomical growth in e-commerce sales. It started pretty small about 10 years ago, and it's scaled up pretty quickly. And we're seeing a similar trend with social selling and marketplace selling. So even though it doesn't look like it's a huge piece of the pie right now, it's pretty critical to understand that growth trend and how important that's going to be for like the next five to 10 years of commerce. Now with that said, <laughs> there's a big elephant here in this graph, which is this bottom line is absolutely astronomical. So in-person retail is still by far and away where all the business is done. Right now, about eight out of 10 purchases happen in a physical store. And even if we look at 2025 projections, seven out of 10 purchases still happen in a retail store. So a lot of us who come from online first world, I think like sleep on this a little bit, and we shouldn't. In-person retail is a tremendous opportunity. So even if you or merchants that you work with are using an online store, they should really be considering, can I leverage in-person in some way? It's the top sales channel out there. In-person retailers tend to do over $400,000 annually in comparison to maybe 100, 120,000 on average for online stores, which you know, makes sense. In-person retail costs more, you have to pay rent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But there are still ways that you can incorporate in-person retail because a lot of people still like to buy that way. So this example is a good example right here. This is a brand with an online store that I had purchased things from. They have like really cool office supplies and really well-designed stuff. And then I found out <laughs> that this brand is in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, 10 minutes away from me. And so that was kind of like mind-blowing and really cool. And what I imagined that they did is looked at all of their purchasing data and said, hey, we got a lot of billing addresses in Pennsylvania. You know, should we think about a retail location? Maybe let's take this data and see, could we get those people to come out in person? So they decided to do a pop-up shop and emailed everybody in Pennsylvania and said, hey, we're going to do this holiday pop-up shop. And so why don't you come in person? You can buy stuff. You know, we'll have discounts for in-person sales. And you know, we'll also have like, um, second quality goods that we can't sell online. But you, know, you can pick up at a steep discount if you want to. So pop-up shops, trade shows, other ways of assessing in-person retail, even if it would not be your gut instinct, is really, really important to evaluate as an online brand. Um, it also drives a lot more loyalty, right? People who pay in person and visit you in person tend to stick with your brand a lot more than people who only engage with you online. So there are some you know, benefits and do's and don'ts of in person, but it's something that I don't think online stores consider enough, and they should be even if it's not obvious. So then how about online channels? Right? Why would we add online channels? In person is obviously where a lot of the money still is and will be for a foreseeable amount of time, even surviving. <laughs> A global pandemic, right? It's here to stay. Um, industry data has already showed us multi-channel sellers are going to see more revenue growth. They're going to grow faster year over year. They're going to grow just by enabling multi-channel selling. But we took a look at data that we had at GoDaddy from 45,000 sellers who created a website over the past year, and they were eligible for our marketplaces product. This is a product that lets you do what we're talking about. It enables multi-channel and marketplace selling. And for the people who are eligible for this product, the ones who enable it earn 72% more on average than the people who just sell web only. They derive 60% of their total revenue from channels, not just their website. 
So even if your website sales decrease slightly, which would be the black thing here, your total sales drastically increase just by enabling multi-channel selling. Now, is it really important? Does consumer choice like really matter here? I think the data that we have from Facebook and Instagram does. It's a little hard to separate this data because you connect to both of those channels like through the same method. So we kind of have to look at like meta properties together. But when I look at people who use Facebook or Instagram, the median revenue, if they enable it, roughly doubles. It's great for discoverability. But interestingly enough, and the reason I wanted to call this one out first, is that when we look at this black bar, which is website only, and this teal bar, which is just enabling Facebook and Instagram, 95% of sellers use that just for discovery. So you can create like a Facebook shop with just like listing your products out there for free. And when people do that, their median revenue does increase. So we have like smaller sellers, we're shifting that midpoint up higher because more of them start to generate revenue. But the average revenue is you know, kind of neutral or, or actually might even be slightly negatively affected. Probably because a lot of people are using this who haven't really developed a marketing strategy yet and just kind of pouring products into there. But here's what's cool. 5% of people do use Facebook or Instagram checkout, which is like I can actually buy it in that surface without ever going to the website. And when people enable that, average revenue doubles, median revenue grows by five times. So it shows you the power of discoverability, but really the power of in-context checkout and being where your customers want you to be drastically changes the conversation about your revenue. So for me, this was a really interesting case study of this is why customers care about buying where they are and less about where your brand wants them to be. And if you want to be successful, you should be facilitating that. Now, I think a lot of people do find Facebook and Instagram kind of hard to navigate. Like you can put up a shop, but then you've got to do extra stuff to enable checkout. So the other social option would be Google. And we do have really great data on Google, like before and after snapshots of the same merchants. So a few months of revenue before they enable it, a few months of revenue after they enable it, and what happens. And when merchants enable Google Shopping, their non-website sales and their website sales both increase. So going back to what we said earlier about restaurants, you know, being on Yelp, et cetera, that presence matters a lot. And just by being on Google Shopping, it tends to like increase buyer trust and their willingness to buy from you. Overall revenue then for every business that enables Google Shopping is positively impacted. We get 180%, almost a three times increase in the median store revenue and about a 10% increase in average revenue. So those kind of disparate numbers tell us that Google's probably great for most sellers, but especially for like nascent or newer sellers who have less revenue because we're bringing that median, that midpoint in the selling up drastically. So what about you know, by industry or by other channels like you know, Amazon, Walmart, Etsy, eBay, et cetera? If you sell general like retail, like apparel, clothing, right? what you think of like standard commerce, you will do well in pretty much any channel. And so if, if you are a merchant or you work with merchants, that should be like the first thing you do when you leave here is, OK, I need to start selling in a different channel with my brand. But there are a few industries where you especially need to think about this because you get disproportionate results in comparison. And there were a couple that were really surprising to me. So if I look at hobby, art and design, home decor, and automotive industries, right here towards the middle, we see that multi-channel selling in, in teal here gives them a huge boost in both average and median revenue. So people tend to maybe be a little bit more brand agnostic when they shop for these things and they're just looking for particular products and it can be a huge boost. But the couple things over here on the end were actually super interesting for me. So like business and industrial companies, essentially like B2B sellers, get a huge lift from starting to sell in different channels. So uh, my takeaway from this is that B2B is, is actually probably a lot better for this than we think, or people probably also don't know where potential customers are and marketplaces can help you kind of uncover those like things you don't know that you don't know that you probably have a lot more prospective customers out there than you realize. And by getting in front of a wider audience, you can help uncover that and find even better target customers or adjacencies for the business. So if we take a look at a few of those in particular, and by the way, I do have a link to these slides at the end if you guys want to kind of refer back to these, these graphs. They're available online. 
Um, but like hobby sellers, for example, I just called out. When they enable social selling or marketplace selling, median revenue, it gets 7 x <laughs> And it's pretty marketplace agnostic, right? You can consider pretty much any marketplace. Etsy seems to be slightly better than the others. So we can have a huge impact on business revenue by just increasing presence and increasing the number of places that the customer can find the business and buy from the brand. Automotive retailers, for example, also calling those out, right? 12x change in marketplace selling through like uh, Amazon, you know, for example, in median sales. So there's huge benefits for a lot of different kinds of industries, a lot of different kinds of um, benefit from both social and marketplace selling. It's not universal, though. I called out fitness and wellness as one that actually is kind of different from the norm, right? Fitness and wellness brands tend to do okay on marketplaces like Amazon, but they actually have a negative impact from social selling. So this industry data can be informative for you or clients, but that kind of shows us how important it is to test and how we decide on the right channels by first and always paying attention to your customers. So if I'm trying to decide on the right channels, First and foremost, your customers are absolutely key. Where are they? How old are they? What's their income? Where do I find them? Talk to them. Where do you shop? Where do you discover new things? It is critical that you actually pay attention to your customer and your products. You can be informed by this data, but this should be your primary driver. So for example, let's take um, similar size sellers. I have an art and design retailer with you know, two employees, $200,000 a year in revenue. Should they sell on the same channels? Well, if one retailer is creating like custom, one-of-a-kind art pieces, you should 100% be on Etsy or eBay. If you're creating a piece and then mass-producing prints, you should avoid them and be on Amazon. Right? It's critical that you pick the right channel. So you can be informed by this data, but Make sure that you let your customers be your guide as to where you're going to go in terms of your first channels. Also think about your marketing, right? If you're not sure which channel's right for you, or you're not getting like a consensus from your customers, which is hard, especially if you're early in your retail journey, think about how do I get traffic now? Do I have a social following that I can leverage or influencer relationships? Right? We had one brand that you know, we were just working with this weekend who had over a million Instagram followers. That should absolutely be the first sales channel that you enable, right? Leveraging that marketing audience, even if you think another one might be better. Because as a brand, if you already heavily use that channel, channel for like customer acquisition, you know that channel, you're gonna be able to use that knowledge more effectively to sell to people than other brands will be able to. And if you're not sure and you don't have a super well-defined marketing strategy, you're just getting traction, I think that data I showed around Google shows that Google's a pretty good, clear first step for a lot of brands. Um, purely because I think it generates a lot of trust when you're in Google Shopping and when you have a stronger presence there than other brands. Now, those are kind of related to you and driving more customers and more revenue. I think the third critical consideration is when you look at this holistically, is there a standard for your industry that you can use to increase discovery or trust? And can you optimize the business with the scale or things that that channel gives you? So even if you're like, I don't know if Amazon's gonna be right, or can I even handle volume if I am successful on Amazon? You should be asking yourself, okay, well, can I optimize my inventory costs if I get a lot more orders? That's a great reason to do it. Even if you might have slightly lower margins on the sales, you're gonna make that up elsewhere in the business. And the discoverability and trust and operational efficiency that can come from adding channels should be something that you consider. Shouldn't be the only driver, but the other like more holistic business benefits, you know, going back to what we saw about trust being a big reason for Google, for example, um, are really important to say, okay, maybe I should lean into this a bit more. So there are a few different things to consider to help you pick the right channels, but once you've picked one or two, how do you even get started? How do I decide, you know, multi-channel, omni-channel, how do I even make this happen in the first place? I want to call out in-person retail as one potential edge case. I know I said it's the best channel in terms of like total sales volume, and it is, it's totally most popular, but if you are brick and mortar right now or your client's a brick and mortar and they're trying to come online, it might be harder, right? A lot of in-person retail, because it's been done for God knows how many years, uses a lot of legacy systems, 
right? You can't always get the data out of them to share it with the other sales channels that you're trying to work with. So um, consider multi-channel and maybe managing your in-person separately from everything online as a stepping stone. Um, or you know, reevaluate like a different payment processor or something if you're okay with that. Usually depends on the sales volume and how many things you have dialed in already. If you're working with clients or you are this merchant and you're not sure which channel to start in, you're not getting great data from customers, you're not really sure where to go, I would start with an online store. When people Google you and they find your online store, it is a huge trust benefit. You look like a much more legitimate brand. But most importantly, if you haven't actually shipped packages, to your customers yet, you're gonna have the most control over the fulfillment in your own store. If you're like selling on Amazon as your first go around and you have like very specific requirements that you need to hit on Amazon, it's just probably gonna be a harder adjustment for you. And then of course, even though your customer interactions are different, like talk to them in store. So how'd you find us? Like where do you like to shop usually? You know, where do you find new brands or things that you like? You're gonna get really important insights and data that way. Now, if you're starting from online, you have an advantage. You can probably go into a more omni-channel focused strategy, save yourself a lot of time and heartache in terms of you know, how you manage your data. You should choose your first one to two channels here based on those previous criteria that we talked about. Where are your customers? What are you most familiar with? And a lot of online stores, as long as you're using like a standard platform, especially something like WooCommerce, you can pretty easily plug into a lot of different channels. So think about the fees of these channels as you start to make your short list. Everyone is different. They're a huge pain to compare. So for example, Amazon might charge you a dollar per item you sell, or you can opt for a plan where you pay $40 a month to sell anything you want to, um, versus like Walmart or um, eBay charge you anywhere from like 3% to 15% of your sales. Right? It is all over the place. So I think it's really worth doing the research in this front to make sure that you understand how to protect your profits. Like, it costs money to get an audience, it should cost money, but you need to make sure that you're aware of that and that you're building that into your margins. Create an audience journey then, once you have a short list, once you know you can afford that channel, map out how are people gonna interact with this. The reason this is key is it's gonna make sure that you've chosen the right app or the right way to get integrated with that channel and that you know how your marketing strategy is going to have to change to account for it and actually be successful in nurturing that channel. So this is perhaps uh, a more robust audience journey than a lot of us are gonna have with our first channel. But think about like, how are people becoming aware of me? How are they finding out about my brand? How do they start to consider purchasing from me or, or like start to build that buyer trust and confidence that they wanna buy what I'm selling? And where do I expect the purchases to take place? Ideally, do I want them checking out in my online store? Do I wanna to try to optimize the channel that they're in already to buy from that channel, given that data shows people like to do that? This is up to you to decide. And knowing your customers really well is gonna make it a lot easier. Once you've done that, that checklist should drive your choice in how you get connected to different marketplaces. So I mentioned, for example, we have an app that does this. We embed it in WooCommerce. And here are some things that we learned as we built this. First, is the data being synced bi-directionally? Meaning if I get an order from WooCommerce, does it push that inventory update to Amazon so I don't oversell my inventory on Amazon? If I get an order on Amazon, does it deduct that inventory from my online store? Right, do those changes happen in both directions to keep everything in sync that I need to be in sync? What data is actually flowing between the systems? You know, is it only syncing product information? Like if I change the description, is that gonna be pushed out to all my channels? Is it syncing inventory? Is it syncing order data? You especially you know, want order data where like, if someone buys from you on Facebook, but they log into your store, they can still see that order. That's a super, super powerful thing to build that trust with your customers. And can you fulfill all your orders in one place? So if I get an order on Amazon, do I have to log into my online store and log into Amazon Seller Central? Or can I just do that in one area? Is a pretty important part of making sure that you save yourself a lot of headache in terms of managing your business once you start to add more channels. And then as you set things up, there's gonna be some non-obvious things. I would say do not commit to a single app right away. Try a couple out, make sure that it fits your workflow. For example, <clears throat> we found that a lot of people don't wanna sync all inventory to a channel, right? They wanna reserve some inventory that's online only or in-person only so they don't oversell. That's something that you can do with some apps. 
can you create pricing adjustments, right? Some marketplaces prohibit you from having a different price on your website and in the marketplace, but some are like, hey, it just has to be competitive. So for example, if you're gonna list things on eBay, can you, let's say, automatically add a 3% markup if it's sold through eBay versus your website? Something that's not obvious, but it's important to consider. And um, you know, can you create your listings in multiple channels? So for example, these are things that we considered when building our marketplace app. There are other options if you don't want to use that, like uh, you know, Celebrate, Trade Gecko, um, Stitch Fix. Like, there's a number of them out there. This is why it's important to evaluate if it's the right tool for the job. And then make sure you go back to that journey in the beginning and finish that journey out. Make sure you have all the data you need. Do you need to update any of the other channels? Is the customer discovering about you, your business through the channel? And take that all the way through to when they have the package in their hand. Do I know how they're going to purchase? Do I know how I'm going to add the order tracking information? Do I know how I'm going to get the package to the customer? Is really critical to make sure that you've planned out this channel strategy and that you actually get that revenue benefit that we're looking for from enabling it. You may find gaps. That's okay. That's where I do think you might have to reevaluate like existing, you know, point of sale or payment systems or whatnot as you go to make sure that you can actually meet that journey that you're looking for. And then update your marketing plan, right? If I want to drive leads to one channel, do I want to close them in that channel? Or do I want to close them on my website or a different channel? You are going to be better off if you're okay making every touch point shoppable. So if I'm going to, let's say, do paid ads, make sure that people can close the sale wherever you're driving them from. It's a general rule of thumb that's pretty good. It doesn't work for every business. You should test it. But that's usually the best place to start is drive the traffic to the channel you want them to buy in based on that journey you mapped. And then set your success criteria, right? Make sure that you have the analytics that can tell you which channels are being successful. Decide if like, okay, if I'm going for operational efficiency, this may not matter as much, but if I want to meet like a specific number of sales through a channel or a specific number of new customers, set that benchmark and then try to measure against that over time. And there are a lot of great apps out there too that give you like a single hub or way to view all of those sales across channels so you can decide where to invest more of your marketing dollars over time. So I know we're getting close to the end of this session here. Right on time, friend, thank you. So a few things to just bear in mind. Is this even right for me? Make sure you evaluate the trade-offs of moving to multi-channel and if that revenue benefit is okay for like the data loss or ad additional overhead that it incurs. Make sure you identify the top channels, especially based on who your customers are. I cannot iterate that enough, but you can be informed by the industry and other data. Make sure that your integration actually covers the things you need to for a customer journey. That's why it's tempting to skip that step, but it's so important. And then make sure you're measuring the success of those channels. It's harder to know how to optimize your marketing dollars in a multi-channel scenario, just because attribution isn't as clean. So if you set those criteria up front of like, here's what I want to hit, here's how I know I'm successful, you know whether to double down on this strategy or pivot and try a new channel. It's pretty critical to make sure that you plan that up front. So with that in mind, I include this slide, especially if you're trying to talk to your clients and help them understand what this process is going to look like. It's a great way to kind of get an overview of this. And as I mentioned, um, I do have some extra stuff in an appendix here that you know, is kind of a little bit more of a granular look at some of that data. But otherwise, you can find these on slideshare.net slash B-E-K-A-R-I-C-E. -E. If you'd like to download them, refer to them. The research is yours. And thank you very much for being here at a very early Saturday session. I appreciate you all waking up for this. Thanks.